Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the Gradient Descent Lecture. We're going to talk about one of the most uh, common algorithms in machine learning, and we'll have a lot of fun with that today. But first, a few items of business. So previously I asked, what is the best technology for uh, us to give you the midterm exam on? And while we only have 28 responses out of 80 plus students. Uh, right now it seems like mm, basically half of you feel like having to type LaTeX while trying to take an exam would be very terrible. So I think we're gonna not do that. We're gonna do a PDF copy of an exam. It's gonna look a lot like the handout that you would actually get if we were still in a lecture hall. So you'll have a PDF copy. You'll have two choices for that, okay? You can, uh, if you have access to software like Adobe Acrobat, if you have a tablet or, you know, various other methods, you can just mark up the PDF copy and hand it straight in to us, okay? So you can write on the PDF electronically, send the PDF back. Or um, you can... If you have a printer, like apparently 60% of you do, you could print it out and actually take it like it was a regular lecture hall exam. And at the end, use your phone, take photographs of all of the pages, don't miss any please, and make sure your photographs, make sure they show all of the paper legibly, right? So kind of important. And then you can send us the photographs. Uh, if that is not your cup of tea, uh, then you could just write stuff out on paper. And just give the individual uh, things. If you don't want to, if, sorry, if you don't have a printer, you can just write on white paper and scan or, or um, you know, send us the paper uh, copy somehow. Yeah, you're not going to send us a paper copy. Okay. All right. So at any rate, Um, so I'm going to give you yet another survey. Uh, so we've been having some issues with discussion sections for the two weeks we've had them. They, some of the discussion sections have not been well attended, um, and attendances are going down from week one to week two. To have a discussion section, we need enough people. We need, you know, it's no fair to the four people who showed up, you know, in one of the sections that they don't have enough people to actually have a discussion with. So um, we were thinking about narrowing down the discussion sections, getting rid of one or two of them so that more people would be in a given discussion section. There would be no discussion sections with only a few people. Uh, so that's what this survey is about. We're asking you, please go to this Google form and take a look and participate so that we can understand your needs and desires whether this is something we should do you know you can say no please don't do that and to do that you have to go to the survey all right um, i've noticed a few responses in piazza or um, also in the anonymous forms that you guys can give me feedback on anonymous form link is in the syllabus I noticed in there that some people are like, hey, could you hold office hours at a different time? Um, no, those are my office hours, but note that it says by appointment. So if you would like to talk with me and you can't make that normal 11 a.m. office hours, send me an email or a message of some kind and say, hey, can I meet you at these times, which are better for me? And if it's at all possible, I will do so. Okay. Uh, assignment two, still working on that. Uh, so make sure you see any kind of syllabus stuff, the logistics module. Midterm is, of course, coming up. We are uh, just a little bit more than a week away. And we will remind her that we're going to have a study week the week before the midterm. We're not going to give you a uh, homework three yet until after the midterm. All right. 
think that's all the business out of the way. Um, so on the fun stuff, gradient descent is the kind of thing which may seem a little scary, which is, I mean, it's really only fair because the descent a 2005 movie is really the last time I actually screamed in a movie theater. Um, so if you like your jumps and bumps in the night, take a look at the descent. If you want to be scared about gradient descent, well, I hope we can help you out uh, so that you don't have to be. Because uh, it's really like conceptually, it's super simple. Even the math is not that frightening. Okay. I mean, come on, the idea of gradient descent, we now have this strong understanding of what a loss function is. And we know that what we want to do is we want to minimize the loss function. Up till now, we've been talking about things as you can solve for it, right? There's a closed form analytic solution to find our argmin but we know that that's not the case for many, many types of problems. There does not exist necessarily a closed form solution. Um, so, well, if you're going to do it not all at once, what you've got to do is iteratively roll down the hill of the loss function until you find a low point. Okay, seems fairly simple, but uh, let's take a look at what it means in practice. So um, obviously the simple soccer ball animation here is just a concept, but uh, I'm going to show you what it means with regression. And it's due to um, this little GitHub gist that I found to kind of uh, demonstrate the process for you. Okay, so if you are interested, you can uh, go do this. You can get this GitHub gist and try it yourself. I'm going to show it to you right now. Okay, so let me switch over there. Connect. And yes, okay. So I've opened it up in Google Collab, and you can take a look for yourself here. So all this does is very similar to my notebooks, which we've looked at in the past. It generates a bunch of data, and you can see that this labeled data is something that looks like it's generated by a linear function. The rest of this code uh, just takes a co it calculates the cost function of uh, ordinary least squares. It calculates the uh, you know, the, the, the target values minus the actual output values and sum of squares on that, right? So that's this function. And you can see that this cost function is very clearly a convex function, right? So the nature of it is that it's got that squared in it, so it's got a parabolic shape. Sounds easy. So um, as we know, we can actually solve for this closed form. Ordinary linear, uh, sorry, ordinary least squares for linear uh, in W kinds of things, we can solve for it. We don't have to do gradient descent. But what if we do, okay? So don't worry about this big block of code. I don't really understand it fully myself because all it does is it creates an animation instead of a static plot, okay? Um, so to do gradient descent, we need to calculate the gradient, something we're gonna cover in great detail in a minute. But first, we just need to actually generate this thing. And you can see here a representation of what happens during gradient descent and fitting of a linear regression, okay? So on the right, it's maybe more clear what's going on, that you can see that uh, it's iteratively, oops, I stopped the animation. So it's starting at some random line and it's fitting it 
iteration by iteration by iteration, getting it closer to a nice regression line that goes through the middle of the data points. Okay. And what you can see on the left over here is that we start out, I'll restart it at one place on the loss function and we bump down and we bump down and we bump down. And every time we bump down, we get closer and closer to the uh, argmin of the function, right? And every time we jump down, what we're doing is we are following the gradient. We're following this tangent line at each data point and going in the downhill direction. Seems pretty simple, okay? It's really no different than that soccer ball thing we showed you, but now you can see it in the context of something we've already solved in a closed form. So let's head on back over here. All right, but okay, that was a, you know, some sort of um, easy to solve thing, right? That there's a, hey, it decided not to work on my animation there. That's super annoying. Okay, whatever. So um, obviously if you have a non-convex function, then we are gonna be in a different situation, right? we can have something which has lots of little wiggles and bumps, and we would like to be able to solve that too via gradient descent. Well, you can, or at least you can make an approximation to solving it. Okay, gradient descent works in any given case. It works here too. Okay, we can follow that line down into a minima, but it's going to be a local minima instead of a global minima. Okay, my computer is really not doing well right now. Okay, so yeah, if you're gonna actually do a loss function like we were showing here, right? That is something which um, is just a made up tiny little toy thing. But if you wanna know what a real non-convex loss function looks like, this is from a deep neural network and it's trained on a very standard large image classification data set okay so this is just one of those things which is a ginormicon neural network and the loss function on it is actually very it, it's not analytically findable but you can approximate it via various techniques so this is what those techniques show you in terms of a three-dimensional uh, loss function. So again, if you're trying to find the points down here in the uh, space of weights in order to make this neural network best classify all the images in the CIFAR-10 data set, okay? If you think this is crazy cool and you like the looks of it, you can see more art from um, these kinds of lost landscapes at lostlandscape.com, where, uh, you know, it turns out in the deep network community, there's a fair number of artists who get really, really into these kinds of visualizations of things that are way, way, way more than 3D in 3D. Let's do the gradient descent thing in something we've already done, right? We mentioned previously at the end of our robust regression thing uh, about doing a regression where instead of trying to minimize the squared error, we can minimize the L1 error, the L1 just being the absolute value, right? So I just wanna remind you that that looks like this instead of having an error function that looks like the this and it being an L2 norm or the squared form of this, then we can do it as the target values minus the actual outputs of our uh, regression and take the absolute values. And that is our thing we're trying to minimize. Okay, 
So we did it in the context of outliers, right? Things that are way, way out there, if you'll remember, have a lot of pull when you put a squared on something. If this was a, a L2 norm, because this error right here is quite large, then that error squared is even bigger and it would pull a line of regression way out here when reality what we want is something like that right so that's why we do l1 regression because we don't have that issue and bing it's going to fit this line which is not as influenced as the l2 one would be okay so this function is convex Okay, but sadly, there is no closed form solution for this. So when you look at the loss function on this, uh, it looks something like this. Okay, and there's no closed form solution because this bit down here is not differentiable. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, we're just gonna run through it really fast. We know what we're doing. We're doing a regression. I wanted to go back to that, okay? We're gonna minimize this function, which is the, uh, you know, matrix form of all this, okay? We have column vectors W and X, which describe the parameters and the inputs, okay? We know this is our loss function okay and gradient descent is about finding the gradient okay what is the gradient the gradient is the partial of the loss function with respect to the weights and that is all so for every weight we take the partial so we get a matrix which is the same size as the weights right and the partial of L sub W with respect to W is going to just be the partial of the loss function with respect to W sub I, so W sub zero at the top here, right? And it's gonna be the respect with respect to W sub one at the bottom element there. That's all. And so it turns out to be this format, which we'll cover in detail here in a second, right? Because we have to realize that a definition of this L1 norm is that the der partial derivative of a function in the L1 norm is equal to the partial derivative of the function when the function is greater than zero. It's equal to the negative of that function when uh, the function is less than zero and it's zero right in the middle, right? So what is this? This is what I just drew a second ago, right? So the uh, positive F sub W, actually I should draw it this way. Oops. Okay, so, so this is positive F sub W and this is the loss function, right? So we have a piecewise linear thing, right? Greater than zero, we have a line going this way. Less than zero, we have a line with the opposite slope and no slope here in the middle, okay? So that's the definition of the partial of a L1 norm. And it's, uh, you can also write this as sine, right? That's a shorthand form of all this stuff. So, all right. So the sine of F sub W with respect to the partial of F sub W times uh, over DW, right? So the partial of the function itself, right? Remember this is a function of W. So the partial with respect to W is just the X right? It's just that term because this goes away because it's a constant. 
this is a function, this is a w, so we get rid of the w on a derivative and we're just left with the x. <clears throat> All right, so that is how we um, calculate the partial of the loss function in L1 space. What is gradient descent? Gradient descent is just, let's do this iteratively. Let's jump one step at a time and each step we're going to move in the direction of the gradient and we're going to move lambda far. We're not going to move the full step. We're going to move in that direction a partial step. Lambda is always going to be a number less than one. And usually it's going to be a number much less than one. Whoops, I was drawing underneath my own body there. So lambda is usually going to be much less than one. Okay, so let's just do this in one dimension. In one dimension, this is called line search, okay? We start somewhere, we pick a direction we want to go, which is downhill, and we go that direction, step size lambda, okay? So we're starting at this location, w sub t, right? we are going to go down the direction v1 one step. Then we're going to get the next iteration. This is w sub t plus 1. And we're going to have a new gradient here. And we can have a new step size. Okay. So note that lambda is also indexed by t. So key to gradient descent in some of its flavors, and it does come in many flavors, is that you can adapt the step size. So maybe you start off with big steps and then you get smaller as a fairly typical one. All right, so we adjust according to the new gradient, we repeat and we do it again and again. We get a new gradient and head down lambda far along that direction. We do it some more. Okay, so we have a situation, right, where we know that we're going to apply this to things that are not convex. So far, we've just been operating in convex spaces with the regular regression and the L1 regression. So in the situation where we are non-convex, recall that there are these things called local minima, right? So what we want is this kind of W star, which is globally optimal. It's the solution that tells us where we are going to do the best. Okay, but there's probably some places in a non-convex uh, loss function which don't reach the same levels. They are called locally optimal. If you start off anywhere in here, you'll go to that place if you're following gradient descent. Okay, and you're not going to be at the lowest point, you're going to be at the almost lowest point. So once again, this gradient is just some vector that we calculate here on this function, and it's a, it's a partial with respect to the w parameter itself. Okay, and the algorithm is, once again, we take what we are at right now for weights, and we update it by lambda in the direction of the gradient going downhill. Okay, so just like we did before, we start off somewhere up here and we move along the gradient to the next location and we repeat. And this distance here is lambda times the gradient. Well, we don't have to just do that in one dimension, like we've been working with so far. Two dimensions, five dimensions, thousands of dimensions, right? So just in a more general sense, we can represent a two-dimensional thing like this as a set of contour plots, right? Anybody who's ever gone hiking and has used a topological map, sorry, topographic map, 
topographic map, you've seen this, right? So these are lines of equal height. So each one of these lines represents a line around the surface at the same level. Okay, so we're following the gradient and we start at some place and lambda is our step size and we just follow the same things, but this time we do it in two dimensions instead of in one. And hopefully we're gonna to head towards some lovely global optimum. All right, so gradient descent is very widely used. Uh, you can use it in all kinds of things. It's not just for neural networks. It's not just for fitting regressions. Um, it can be applied so it can be applied to both convex and non-convex functions. If it's applied to a convex function, and there's a couple of other criteria as well, which we're not gonna get into, but it is provable in that case that gradient descent finds a globally optimum solution. Okay, well, that's no big deal you say, because we know that for things that are convex, uh, it's often the case that there's an analytic closed form solution. Okay, well, fair enough. But that's a place where we have a guarantee that we're gonna find the right answer for a gradient descent. Now, in practice, it seems to work pretty well for things that are not convex. Uh, and there are a bunch of ways in which we try to make it work as well as it possibly can. And that's what I was referring to as all the flavors of gradient descent. They're all variations on this theme to get to uh, the best possible performance in a crazy mixed up landscape like that deep neural network we looked at, okay? Now in non-convex spaces, obviously there's no guarantee, but practically we generally find a local optimum okay-ish Right? I mean, if we pick the right version of, of gradient descent, we can get to a local optimum at least. And critical is those lambdas, those learning rates, the step sizes. Okay, They are the most basic way in which we can try to get to a good local optimum. So um, it's often better to go slow. So generally when you have tiny, tiny learning rates, it may be annoying in the sense that you have to do this over and over and over and over again uh, until you get an answer. It may take you thousands, tens of thousands, millions of iterations to converge. But at least with a small lear fixed learning rate, you know you're going to you know, not have bad problems, which we're going to explore here in a second. Okay, so um, what kind of bad problems am I talking about? Well, let's go back over here. So here's our gradient descent, and it's maybe interesting to note what happens in our linear regression if we up the learning rate, okay? So if I change this to say 0.25 instead of 0.05. So it's five times bigger. What are we gonna see? Well, let's find out. It's diverging infinitely. You may notice the number on the error here is getting bigger and bigger. That's no good. Actually, let's try something a little bit smaller because I wanted you to at least see it bounding around a bit. Ha! Oh, I know what I did wrong. I forgot which one I just which one I'd found. Okay, so a tenth. So this is just twice as big. Now you're going to work, right? Right. Okay, so you can see this time, it the, the gradient starts off here. It jumps past the right place, and it bounces back. So somewhere in the middle, 
we're going to see something which would be uh, a rad relatively stable rattling around and not quite converging, okay? Um, but it's way easier to show you all this in um, this format. Okay, so this is a, a tutorial on gradient descent by somebody who works at Google AI by uh, Pedro Gosa. And it's a quite a lovely introduction, okay? So if you're finding my treatment of this a little bit difficult, feel free to head on over to the Pedragosa tutorial and look it through yourself. Now this goes way further than we're gonna go today too. So if you're interested in all these different flavors of gradient descent, this is an excellent introduction to them. But let's take a look at what we're doing here. The only thing to note is that his notation is a little different where uh, instead of a loss function L, he's calling it Q. And uh, it's important to note that this is just exactly what we were looking at earlier, right? We start off at, oh, and I should mention he's using X instead of W for the parameter you're estimating, okay? So this X is parameter, right? This is lambda. He's just got a different Greek letter there. And here is the gradient, okay? Which remember, the gradient is merely for a matrix. It's just the partial of the function with respect to the parameter W, or in this case, X, at that location, at every location in the matrix. All right, so we're talking about the same thing. Our letters, our notation are a little different. So this thing has a nice little interactive slider. You can see what happens in several different uh, kinds of functions. So this is a well-conditioned quadratic function. That means it looks just like, this guy right there, okay? So it is the same kind of shape that we're talking about. In other words, it's a two-dimensional convex shape, so we know we should be able to do really well with it, right? All right. So in that kind of uh, setup, you can see that it's easy for almost any parameter that you can pick for step size to converge to the solution. Works real well. When you get really big, it starts to get a little weird and it starts to overshoot a bit, but eventually it finds its way down into the center. Okay. Now, if you have something which is badly conditioned, what does badly conditioned mean? Badly conditioned means that the whole mountain, uh, sorry, valley setup is really flat at some point. Okay, that's what uh, not well conditioned means or badly conditioned or ill conditioned. So the loss function here is super flat. And when it's flat, when you find, when you're looking for where the hill is, there ain't much of one, right? So if there's not much of a hill, then it becomes hard to follow the gradient. And it can take forever, especially with small step sizes. So banging out a bigger step size can help power through the flats, all right? So this is a non-convex data set. So this data set looks, um, so it has a saddle point and a banana shape to it. Um, I should really have found you a picture of this one, but let me just really quickly draw it out so uh, the, the shape of the surface is like this, okay? So it has, it has ridges going up, and it's non-convex because you have this wiggle here, right? So that's an up and down. 
So it's, it's a valley which has a hill inside it, okay? All right, Let's come back over here, bring this bad boy up. So you can see this starts to become a more difficult thing. And starting close to the optimum at least gets you into the right ballpark. Actually, that's another thing I should have mentioned earlier, is that um, in a convex problem, it doesn't matter where you start. Gradient is going to take you to the global optimum. For a non-convex problem, where you start is going to affect where you finish. So if you start in the neighborhood of a local optimum, you're probably going to get sucked into the local optimum. If you start in the neighborhood of a different, much better local optimum, you're going to get into a better place, right? All right. So that's kind of cool. I don't, so I again want to emphasize that overall, that this is very, very easy as a computation, right? It's a very simple bit of pseudocode here. All right, so now there are different ways to solve this whole thing. Um, so I mentioned previously that you don't, right, this is all the same step size, okay? Each one of these, lambda, is the same size, right? It's whatever we're setting here. Now I mentioned earlier that we can do adaptive step size. With an adaptive step size, you can get quicker to the function's optimum. You can prevent some of the problems that uh, arise when you have these kinds of funny shapes, right? So for instance, the ill-conditioned um, version of the, the quadratic, it was very hard for it to get all the way to the optimum. With an adaptive strategy using what's called backtracking line search, which finds the right step size at each time point. It gets you all the way to the optimum, okay? So the exact algorithm is beyond what we're gonna cover right now, but I do want to show you that there are these things where we do, we have different flavors of gradient descent. They add on something like an adaptive step size, which is automatically calculated in order to do this. So the adaptive step size algorithm, I will just mention briefly, it's really very simple, right? Um, what you do is you check to see what is, so I, I take the current weight and I update by the, by the gradient, okay? That gets me to a new place on the loss surface, right? So whatever that loss is of that new location, that's on the left-hand side here. And on the right is merely the loss that we started out at, subtracting out half of the step size, okay? So if you're, if you're, where you're at is, where you're going to end up at following the gradient is much is lower than a, a fixed version of the gradient lambda over two times the L2 norm, the magnitude of the gradient. Then what you do is at that point, you make your step size smaller, you cut it in half, okay? So you're trying to always take, essentially you're always trying to take steps which are about half of, a, half of the lambda times the gradient, wherever you are right now. So when the gradient gets really steep, the gradient is big, right? Then you can take giant steps. And when the gradient is really shallow, you can take small steps. Okay, so that's the nature of the, of the backtracking algorithm. Now again, there's more versions of this kind of approach. So this tutorial goes on and on with different techniques that are related in concept, but use different math 
than gradient descent, right? So Newton's method uses the Hessian, which is not the gradient, not the, the one partial, but it's the second partial, okay? It's the Hessian. And Newton's method does better uh, in general on most on many kinds of problems than gradient descent. So using the second partial instead of the first partial. Uh, however, there's all kinds of computational issues with with this. Okay, so I'm not going to go into it. There's loads. There's a couple more of these. There's two more or three more that this goes into, but I just wanted to give you the idea of all these different flavors. All right, so where are we at now? Well, just about perfect in timing. So that was really all I had to cover in gradient descent. What I just want to do is I do want to cover one more thing in robust regression, okay? So something that we didn't get to the last time when we got through robust regression is uh, one last version of that, okay? So we covered the L1 norm as, a, um, as the error function that we're gonna minimize as the loss function. And we, we covered it again just a minute ago. But what if we want to do two separate functions, okay? What if we're trying to sum up two functions that are going to be in the loss function? Well, let's just cover the basic math first. So if you have two functions, all right, which take this form. So one of them is looks suspiciously like the L1 norm, okay? And the other one looks, uh, well, the other one is also of that shape, but it's not, that's not important. What's important is that they're convex, okay? Then what happens when you add them together? Well, in the case of two convex functions of this form, right? So we have this one and this one. We add them up together. Well, mathematically, you get this. And you can tell, so this is a flat line at that point, right? So we know that what we get is, oh, this is a bad drawing, but you get the idea. Um, what you get is something that looks like this, okay? It's three lines piecewise linear, okay? So what do you think is going to be true of the convexity problem, right? So we have a convex function and another convex function. This looks suspiciously convex, although not strictly convex, right? Ask yourself for one second, why is it not strictly convex? Think about the chord relationship. That one lies straight on the chord. So it can't be strictly convex, which requires that it's less than the chord. This is a less than equals to situation, okay? All right, so the summation of two convex functions like this, which is what we just showed you, is this resulting thing convex? I gave away the answer, didn't I? Okay, because it is. Okay, so I covered that bit of math because I wanted to show you what's one of the most standard penalized regressions that's out there, okay? What if you want to do a combination of L1 loss and the squared loss, L2 loss? Hmm. Well, these are two functions which we know to be convex in both cases. Well, then we can go ahead and, oh, I want to skip this whole slide because this is just showing you squared loss, right? Here's the squared loss, okay? Well, if we're gonna do gradient descent on the squared loss, what's the 
partial of this with respect to w? Well, we have a w squared term here. So the partial is going to be a 2xw situation. So that goes into the gradient. And presto changeo, we can go ahead and follow the gradient downhill, as we demonstrated earlier when we were doing OLS style squared error with gradient descent in the very beginning here, right? But putting the L1 loss and the L2 loss together is uh, something which is known as the lasso, the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, okay? It's super, it's maybe a more high-end regression, but it's a very, very useful one. And fundamentally, the lasso looks like this, where we have the L2 norm part here and the L1 norm part there. And you'll note that there is an alpha on the front of, in this case, the L1 norm. You can couch it any way you want. Actually, typically, another way you see it couched is uh, this. So the L2, the L1 norm is alpha, and the L2 norm is 1 minus alpha. So alpha is a parameter which dials back and forth how much you want L1 squish and how much you want L2 squish. Okay, And in doing this, we're going to regularize the weights to cause the uh, regression to not get too complicated, to not overfit. Okay, so other than that, we already kind of know what to do. We know that we need to find the what? Yes, indeed, the partial with respect to w to make the gradient. And it's just the L2 partial plus the L1 partial that we've previously already talked about. Okay, and no great mystery what you do next. You go ahead and follow the gradient downhill. Okay. So there's a little mishmash. He did jam that in there on the back end, but I, uh, I just wanted to make sure I covered it because I know that it was something that was covered in previous quarters of this class. Um, so again, just returning back to gradient descent, because that's really the point of what we're doing today. We know that it is a dead simple algorithm, okay? The algorithm requires in its basic form this much code, right? We know that it's super powerful because even in the case of a uh, non-convex loss function, we know that we can, for some reasonable choices, get to at least a local minima. And in practice, local minima may be good enough for us. We can't get to the global, right? In a crazy, in a crazy uh, space that looks like, um, put this back here, go here, back to this one. In a crazy space like this, there's no way that we're going to find the global for any finite set of searching, okay? So we just hope that the local minima that we end up in are good enough. Now you could potentially, I mean like, it, it is a um, theoretical possibility that you could do exhaustive search right? You could go and check every single location. You could just, um, here, let's try to at least make it a nice version of it, okay? You can grid up the state space of Ws, and at some very fine mesh, right? And it would have to be a very fine mesh, and just sample everywhere along this grid, okay? And then you would find out which number gave you the best loss, 
okay, which, which set of the parameters. Obviously, computationally, that's ridiculously expensive, and more to the point, it's not just ridiculously expensive, it's exponential with the number of parameters. So for something like a deep neural network, which may have hundreds of millions or even billions of parameters, being exponential to the billionth power is a terrible idea. You're not going to finish that computation before the universe ends. Okay, so that's why approximations like gradient descent have come into vogue because they let us find good enough solutions even for things like billion parameter deep neural networks. Okay, that's all I had for you. I hope you have a fun day and I'll chat with you some point soon. Bye.